Welcome. Good morning, everyone. This is Think Tech Hawaii, the rule of law in the new abnormal. Today's title, such as it is, is C Change SEE, comma C Change SEA. Hey, we'll see where that goes. We have the honor of having with us Professor Emerita Bernalia Randall from the University of Dayton School of Law. Hey, Professor now Emerita. Emeritus Ben Davis, U of Toledo School of Law, Dean and Professor, also Emeritus, I believe, um, Jim Alfini from North Illinois and South Texas Schools of Law, Jeff Portnoy, our leading First Amendment and constitutional expert, and also color commentator for the UH basketball team for a number of years. So folks, one of the topics that's raised its, its head recently and looked around to see if it saw its shadow is voting rights. Brother Ben, something recent on that? Well, I, I watched uh, Senator Warnock's uh, maiden uh, speech on the floor of the Senate, uh, and uh, it was really something to, to listen to. Uh, he pointed out that in his father's generation, um, the senators from there were Senator Russell, Richard Russell, and Senator Talmadge, mm. who were two of the most uh, pro-segregation senators of their time. And in fact, that Senator Talmadge's dad had been the governor of Georgia. Um, you know, I'd once said that, you know, no blacks will vote here, and Somebody asked him, well, how is he going to deal with that? He wrote down one word on a piece of paper, pistols. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, you know, the, the, just the concept of what uh, uh, it means to have uh, Senator Warnock as a, as a black person representing Georgia. And he also talked about Senator Ossoff as a Jew representing Georgia. How amazing that really is uh, in this country. And uh, and he was very, you know, the emphasis he put on is that this is the greatest uh, uh, anti-voting effort, a voter suppression effort uh, since Jim Crow times. He put it, he put it right there, and uh, you know, he's talking about sort of the civil rights movement. And one of the interesting issues is to what extent the private sector is going to step in and and say things. And then you know, you kind of got a little mealy mouth stuff from coca-cola and home depot right now as opposed to sort of a full-throated you know support for the various bills and then another game that we're seeing right now is the sort of the whole filibuster game which is like we're going to get rid of the filibuster rules you know it's okay to vote for it <laughs> you know you can have more than 60 people vote for the for the, for the legislation that's being proposed you know you don't have to it's not a filibuster about it's okay if you vote for it you know uh, but it's a, so it's, uh, I, I just saw something that there'd been a 46 page bill introduced in Georgia and then today, or kind of bait and switch was a 93 pager, you know, which has got even more stuff. Like I, the one I love is that it's illegal to give people water waiting in line. You know, I'm like, really? I mean, really do you, you know, where do people come up with this stuff? That level of callous hate, you know? That you're gonna really, you know, thinking right down to the who's standing in line and what they're gonna have is water. I mean, it's just it's shameful. It really is shameful. It, Don't it, that. No, Don't no Sunday that. voting, right? It closed down the souls to the polls that many, many black churches helped to generate. And maybe the yeah. 46 pages got to 93 because they didn't notice it was front and back. <laughs> What you need to remember, <laughs> what you need to remember, everybody, is that these people who are introducing the bills were voted in by a yeah, majority yeah. of the people in their district. So, you know, this focus on the individual who introduces the bill is really mis mis leading in the wrong direction. They are, in their own minds, representing the people in their districts. That's the scary part. That's the scary part. Well, Jeff, you have to acknowledge, though, give them some credit. 
<laughs> they may be racist, but they are hypocritical. Give them that. <laughs> well, you know, there's plenty of hypocrisy allegedly going on right now. Look what the Democrats are doing in challenging the election in Iowa that a Republican won by six votes that they put into the House. At the same time, they ranted and raved about all of the efforts to challenge the last election. I know you can make legitimate distinctions, but really, you know, the Republicans, the only Republican member of the House, I believe, from Iowa is now being challenged by the Democratic majority on a pure party line vote. Now, how that'll come out, who knows, but that vote was certified by a bipartisan election commission in Iowa. So, you know, every time the Democrats take two steps forward, they take a step and a half backwards as far as I'm concerned. This is an unnecessary challenge. And I think it just leads to people who want to believe in hypocrisy, gives them some proof. Well, and the other thing that it does, Jeff, is when we were kids, right, we all played some kinds of after school games or sports or something. And they taught us, okay, if you're playing baseball and you lose by one run in 17 innings, just go out there and play better tomorrow. Hey, Jim, you had some thoughts. Well, you know, I was wondering whether the sole rationale for these voter suppression um, uh, bills in the state legislature was fraud. Um, I, I can't believe that after all of the discrediting of the fraud allegations, they still come back with that. Um, is some of it, though, that, hey, we had to respond to the COVID crisis. Now that the COVID crisis is pretty much going to be over, uh, we can go back to, to normal. You know, we can have, it, uh, we can make it tougher to vote absentee. Uh, we can make it um, uh, tougher to come in later at night because, you know, we don't need, we don't need all these um, uh, frills, if you will. Uh, I, I don't understand, you know, how they're getting away with it. I mean, what are the, what, what, what's the rationale? Um, because some of the, 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 I, I believe, Jeff, that there's a poll in Iowa that shows that the voters are not in favor of this for the most part. Um, so I think there's going to be some backlash um, uh, among the voters, particularly among independents. Well, I think I wish there would be some backlash, but I have no hope whatsoever, largely because this what's happening is not new. The Republicans and the Democrats, the Democrats have been doing something really kind of different. In fact, the, 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 they've been working with the Republicans to suppress the ability of third parties to be on the ballot. Uh, and in fact, I think one of the the bill that uh, had a measure, one of the bills that they're promoting, voting bill, actually has a measure that increased the amount of money that a third party has to raise to be on a ballot by like 600 mm. percent. So that's a form of, I mean, if you, I hate to have this word come out my mouth because I don't believe we have one. But for our pseudo-democracy, <laughs> that is a form of, of suppression, oppression, suppression. And then the Republicans have been suppressing votes as long as I can remember in this in, in Republican run um, states they have been doing all the all of the stuff they're doing has been done one place or another before the big deal is so much of it is happening right after the pandemic i mean right after the vote and they're mixing a lot of different stuff and so, and so you might have two or three things in one state and two or three things in a different state now we have all of it in you know georgia and all of these other states but it really isn't new behavior it's just more the same but isn't it yeah. sort of helpful in a way for now in the sense that 
And now we have a good understanding. Why do Republicans need to gather and hoard so much money? Because it, it, it takes a lot of money to buy enough votes and to suppress enough votes to actually beat the majority. That's the only way to do it, as far as the late night host can tell. <laughs> I don't know. I, 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 have, I have been frustrated by the voter suppression for so long that uh, it's hard for me to get riled up about Georgia when, I mean, it's like we should have been riled up 15 years ago uh, mm. and, and stopped it then and uh, we wanted to be play nice so we didn't do it. Now it's interesting, it goes in conjunction with the, I, you know, I, uh, you were, we were saying last time that uh, uh, getting rid of the uh, filibuster. I, 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 I mean, I'm, I don't, I think they should get rid of it. But if they don't get rid of it, I think they should make it harder. They should go, go back to, you know, they should not make it so easy where all you have to do is voice the idea and th that you're going to filibuster and then shift the responsibility to sh get 60 votes, then there has to be some actual filibustering of some kind that goes on. <laughs> well, the rules of the Senate are so arcane and so undemocratic. Filibuster is just one part of it, and it's the one that people can grab onto because it's so hard to understand all the other rules of that institution. And, you know, as McConnell said the other day, even though, you know, it was a threat, do away with the filibuster. He can keep the Senate from ever even going into session because their rules are so bizarre. You know, I mean, uh, uh, they could make a rule that said you can't go into session unless you have a quorum. And you know how rarely that is, that they have more than two or three people on the floor, et cetera, et cetera. So you know, I think the filibuster has just become a focus and uh, of, the, of really, again, how arcane the center rules are, starting with how they get elected, two from every state, regardless of your population, yeah. to the way they operate on a daily basis. It's very undemocratic. And no that was without the purpose objection. from the beginning. <laughs> you know, but there's all kinds of ways to get around it. Now, you know, the big push to uh, maybe make D.C. a state so the Democrats pick up two more senators. Uh, who knows if Puerto Rico is lurking in the background to get two more Democratic senators. So it's bizarre. <laughs> Well, it, but, you know, that push for D.C. to be a state has been a long-standing push. And uh, and regardless of uh, the impact <laughs> on voting, uh, Demo the D.C. should be a state. And if Puerto Rico wants to be a state, it should be a state. And if Guam wants to be a state, I think we ought to listen to get rid of most of the territories and allow them to be regular states. Uh, I don't know why we, it's a, it's a holdover from colonialism to continue to have territories that uh, don't, that are not state. Uh, so it would be a good idea to get rid of all of the territories and make them state. But I doubt that that's going to happen. I mean, yeah, but Jeff, your, your point's an important one because the least representative legislative branch is the one that controls the appointment of all the federal judges, which are lifetime appointments. And cabinet and, members. Let me ask you ask a question. Lifetime appointment is not a constitutional thing, is it? No, that's it's not. <laughs> Constitution says during good behavior. And I love to remind federal judges that that's what it says. None of us would be eligible then. <laughs> that's right. 
I mean, we always make this assumption lifetime. Of, I mean, we always do the lifetime appointment, but that's one change. I mean, they couldn't get it past the Senate because of the conservative Democrats would, would team up with the Republicans. But one change they could make is to put a limit on appointment time to say, you know, you don't get to be a life, have a lifetime appointment. You get 25 years. And then, you know, up and out. Well, I mean, that's an idea. You know, let me run, run something by you guys that I've thought about over the years and I never seem to get any traction on. Um, there aren't too many. It, you don't even have to be a lawyer to be on the Supreme Court. No. Wouldn't it be interesting to have an informed person who's not a lawyer on the Supreme Court to keep the lawyer's you know, um, uh, straight there. Uh, I, you know, I was thinking of, you know, a prominent journalist who writes about the law, you know, would have sort of the same qualifications. Um, the thing that really troubles me is we've gotten to the point where all, every member of the Supreme Court is a former federal judge, mm -hmm. you know, like unless you serve as a federal judge, you're not qualified to go on the court, which is, ridiculous some of our yeah. best justices came right out of the profession or out of the out of congress hugo black was a senator um you know i i think if you look back um i this notion that we somehow have to the the justices have to be sort of grow up within the federal judiciary to get to the court i think we should try to change that you yeah, know I, I, feel I agree with way. you. I feel the same way about law professors. <laughs> about what? Law professors. Law prof <laughs> We'd be better off if they didn't have law degrees and we just allowed anybody to get up there and teach. Don't you agree? Yeah. Well, to tell you the truth, <laughs> I think legal education is overrated and designed to be difficult so that people will think lawyers are smart, but that in truth, it is a decent education that ain't as difficult as it, it as it uh, as it is structured to be. And yes, I think some non lawyers could do a great job of teaching lawyers because we don't actually teach them to practice law. We just teach them substantive. And so why couldn't some non lawyer who knows the law get up there and many law professors, I don't know whether this is still true, but many law professors don't even really, you know, they come out of three years practice in a firm. Ha, huh, that was me. What does that mean? A large firm, it means you run errands. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the things that we noted was, Okay, I need to go to headphones, sorry. Um, one of the things that we noted was that in Ben's and Jim's in my field, in dispute resolution, the great majority of the public policy mediators and facilitators who are the best and the most respected are not lawyers. What does that tell us? Maybe it's time to move toward a far more interdisciplinary approach, not just to legal education, but to education generally. See, but the problem, Chuck, is that the lawyers move in and they colonize the professions. <laughs> Only the Republican uh, a good example is family mediation. When I first started in the 80s, most of the family mediators were mental health professionals. They were, you know, psychologists, um, uh, psychiatric social workers, or what have you. That's pretty much gone by the board because the lawyer, now that mediation is popular and you can make money doing it, the lawyers have moved in and they've colonized that profession. So we, we need to shame the lawyers, <laughs> really. Well, the legal profession, unfortunately, is based on winning, winning and losing. 
that that's the that's the bedrock of the legal profession. Your job is to represent your client, whether it's in litigation or transactional, or whatever, and win. Whether you win in court or you win in mediation, quote unquote, or you win in drafting a real estate deal, that may not be the best way to resolve conflicts. Well, you're speaking to the choir here. Yeah, the tone deaf choir, but the choir nonetheless. <laughs> but but the well, other I good point that... think, is that a function? I just gave a, a talk to you, New Hampshire, and I basically, uh, University of New Hampshire, I basically argue that there really, it really is time for legal education to relook at itself and lawyers to relook at itself and rethink. Winning as the sole goal of, uh, as opposed to dispute resolution uh, in, in a multicultural, multi-ethnic value system where you have uh, a lot of different value systems and we have to live together having a lawsuit or having a, a process where one person wins over the other and that's the goal may not be all that conducive to maintaining relationships and lawyers may need to help maintain relationships as a goal as opposed to winning. Yeah. Well, there's another point that flows from what you folks just said, which is if you look at what mediation, dispute resolution, arbitration have become is basically a competitive sales industry in which people bring their conflicts, their disputes to dispute resolvers who sell them solutions that they craft and they're known as closers and they're known as deal makers and all that stuff. Let me ask, let me ask you guys a question, getting back to politics. Maybe we should have a group of mediators who work in Congress, you know? Because it's not working the way it is with two political parties completely at opposite ends. Maybe we should have, I know this is just ridiculous, but maybe we should have a federal law that appoints 10 mediators who work either for the House of Representatives or the Senate, and their job is to bring about a uh, 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 agreement on any particular issue. <laughs> right. And we impose a requirement of good faith negotiation on the parties as well. <laughs> so mm. we'll see how far that goes. But, but the other part that comes out of this, and Jeff, you're going right at it, and I like that, is that while commercial mediators are great for individual commercial problem solving for pay, they are not so great generally at systemic problem solving. Whereas the public policy facilitators and mediators, right? The Peter Adlers, the Ann Goslins, the Susan Podzibas, the Ken Close. Larry Susskind. Larry Susskind's, yeah. Lisa bingham you know, these These people grasp and do that. And we are not engaging in system design conflict prevention, management, or resolution. And Jeff, exactly what you're talking about is that systemic conflict prevention and management and resolution vehicle. Well, hey, I, I, think, I think Bernelli had put her, her finger on it. I think we need to change the lawyering paradigm so that you know people are trained in law schools to be problem solvers, not to be you know white knights on or white trial, whatever the metaphor is, you know, out to, you know, win justice. Um, so that's a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I, 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 I think that problem solving paradigm needs to be, you know, the business schools have gone in that direction. Mm -hmm. The law schools need to. Um, but that's a, that's a hard sell. So as when we move into our last three minutes, yeah, go. Jeff, Ben, somebody was going to say something. Was it me? Well, uh, how do you say her last name, the new Secretary of Interior? Holland, Deb Holland. Holland. I'm like really, 
I have no faith that she's going to be any different than any other Democrat, but I'm happy to see her in the position <laughs> as the first interior, first Native American uh, over the uh, Department of Interior. So and that's she a, got in. That's a really important point, I think, Bernadette, because she got in as a Native American, and she got in against the most concentrated opposition of the fossil fuel industry that we have seen on any cabinet nominee, probably ever. So what does that mean? Well, I think- uh, It means there won't be any pipelines along across <laughs> Indian <laughs> reservations. I, I, yeah, we'll see. I think it means the fossil fuel industry is in a weakened state right now. They, you know, they're, they, uh, they're, they're, <laughs> They're not riding as high as when the the cost of fuel was much much higher. There were wars in certain places that led to the sort of risk pricing at a higher level. So you don't I think, think that might be one part of it. You don't think an eight thousand dollar electric bill for one day is too high? <laughs> <laughs> Isn't there some irony in that? The power outage was in the big fossil fuel state. Absolutely. <laughs> oh man, I'm telling you, it's so. Ben, question. Yes. How how is Mitch going to do scorched earth without fossil fuels? <laughs> we we have a minute to answer. Rubbing that. sticks together. <laughs> <laughs> Always with a quip there, Chuck, I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Once in England. So last thoughts, folks, as we're in our last minute here. Uh, Jeff, can I, uh, 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 Chuck, can I end with a pun here? Please. Um, when is a door not a door? When it's a jar. Very good, Jeff. When it's a what? <laughs> when it's a, a jar. jar. A, oh. <laughs> <laughs> a, jar, a jar. Oh, I get it. <laughs> now, I thought I made that up, but maybe, but, you know, maybe you're just that good, Jeff. Yeah. And good one. No names. No names have been called. Jeff and Ben have emerged unscathed. Thanks oh, to yeah. referee right. Jim. And what? thanks to the guy. I'm after you next time, Ben's. Jeff. I got you, man. I was going to pick on James for talking about a white knight. I was surprised that somebody didn't respond to the first word in that yeah. two-word phrase. <laughs> so we'll be back in two weeks. Set your schedules. Think Tech Hawaii, Rule of Law in the New Abnormal, with another cast of hopefully these all-stars. Come back and see us. Thank you all. Wow. Okay. Thank you. All right. Bye, everybody.